I think the being able to get out there and do big chunks of hard work alone um, is hugely valuable mentally as well as physically and that you're not sitting on the wheel drafting or you're not sitting in a group of runners. Um, you actually, you know, got the wind on your nose and um, you're grinding hard. The Triathlon Show 220. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview coach Craig Kirkwood. Craig is a former elite runner. He's a Kona finisher and a coach of elite and age group triathletes and runners, where probably his most uh, famous athletes are Hayden Wild, who is uh, a very exciting up and coming a draft legal triathlete from New Zealand and Sam Tanner who is a mid distance runner. So in this interview he discusses his coaching methodology and uh, thoughts on uh, the training the training strategies that uh, in particular Hayden Wild uses to get to the highest level at the draft legal uh, racing scene. Before that, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration. Two weeks ago in episode 218, we had founder Andy Blow back on the podcast. So I highly recommend that you go and listen to that if you haven't already, because that will give you a great picture of what Precision Hydration is all about. Uh, It's uh, both practical and scientifically informed information. The advice that Andy gives is always very actionable and uh, pragmatic. So uh, that's uh, there are plenty of reasons why I really enjoy talking with uh, Andy. And uh, the same goes for not just hydration and nutrition, but just training in general. And we've had those discussions as well, both on the podcast and and off the podcast. But uh, that's a great way to get to know Precision Hydration as a brand and as a company. So episode 218 go back and listen to that and if you want to try precision hydrations electrolyte products you can get 15 percent off your order with the promo code that triathlon show 15 on precisionhydration.com and big thanks to roca that are the world leading manufacturers of wetsuits tri suits swim skins goggles uh, and high performance eyewear you can go to roca.com forward slash tts as in that triathlon show and that is where you will get your 20 percent discount code as i explained last week this will be a, a much more permanent and better solution as opposed to changing up the discount code uh, way too frequently because it just spreads on the internet to people for to whom it shouldn't be spread because this uh, discount is meant obviously for uh, that triathlon show listeners so uh, obviously roca wants to measure the impact that they're sponsoring the podcast has and uh, not uh, how it uh, winds up on obscure corners of the web so roca.com forward slash tts is where you should go now and they will still give you the same 20 percent discount on your roca order Without any further ado, here's my interview with Coach Craig Kirkwood. Welcome to That Triathlon Show, Craig. How are you doing today? Very good, thank you. How are you doing? Very good as well. Uh, we're uh, at an 11-hour at an time difference here, so uh, you're uh, right in the New Zealand evening and I'm in the very early uh, Finland morning, so uh, it's uh, good that we managed to to get a time to to do this talk i am re- really looking forward to it yeah I'm so sure we let's start as well too. Let, let's, <laughs> sorry um, <laughs> let, let's start with just uh, a brief background and uh, bio of yourself who are you and uh, how did you get into endurance sports and coaching sure um so i've been involved in endurance sport for a, a very long time started as a as a youth runner kind of 14 years old or so uh progressed through um uh, my current running career um towards the marathon um ended up running um at a reasonably high level so i ran a 213 marathon um and then suffered some injuries tried to qualify for beijing olympics um and at that point i said to my brother-in-law if i hadn't uh, if I didn't qualify, then I'd do an Ironman with him the following year. So, subsequently, didn't qualify um, and managed to jump into Ironman the following year and got hooked. 
and that was in 2009 was my first Ironman. Um, so just on 10 years ago and um, just progressed through triathlon since then. So it's been a, it's been a pretty cool experience. And, and in triathlon then, you went on to go to Kona as an age grouper a couple of times, I believe? Yes, yeah. So I qualified after my and my first Ironman. I went to uh, Ironman New Zealand. Um, I was first age grouper and I think eighth overall or something like that. Um, went 909 for my first one. Um, ran a 254, I think it was, off the bike. So um, I was, yeah, I was pretty stoked to do that and go to Kona. And I had two other attempts, um, I think 20. Oh, 2013 and 2015 maybe um never very did, did very well there uh, it's very difficult coming from new zealand um and having no heat acclimatization to uh to kona you go from the depths of winter to 40 plus degrees um celsius and um it just never ends well yeah yeah sure uh <laughs> in your background as a as a runner and then later as a triathlete what was yeah. your own coaching situation like did you have uh, many coaches along the way to guide you or i believe that at the start of your career at least a lot of it was self-coaching yeah so i grew up in a reasonably small town um and there wasn't anyone around who was doing any coaching so like all young new zealand boys um or young athletes as runners uh, we picked up Arthur Lydia's books and um scrolled through those and you know he was a big influence on my early career um i basically just opened his his book and followed the plan in the back, um, kind of day for day, um, leading up to a national championships. Um, and yeah, I ran some pretty good times as a high school kid. Um, but it was all self coached and, you know, I didn't really know what to do if I had been sick or if I got injured, where, what I should do in terms of taking days off or should I, you know, just resume where I was or carry on or all those kind of things. I'd said no, no one to kind of inform me. So it was a lot of trial and error. Um, Ended up going to the US on scholarship and ended up at university where the coaching structure was a pretty, it was a pretty loose environment. Um, and if I was to send a kid over there now, like I did this, to send Sam Tanner to the University of Washington last year. And, you know, we did a lot of research, which you can do now with the internet. But back when I went, there was no, there was no way to research those universities and no, no opportunities to kind of find out a bit more information. So you're really just taking a gamble. Um, the pros of yeah. that was that I learnt I learnt a lot um, about myself and about training and about um, coaching and um, downside is I didn't run very well, um, but you know it had, it had its benefits and you know those kind of things I carry forward now to what I'm doing um, current day, so that's you know, been great. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you mentioned Sam Tanner. He's a, a very good runner uh, over there in New Zealand, or now going to the United States. Uh, what's his? Can you? What's his best distances and uh, the sort of times that he's running? Yeah, so as an eighteen-year-old, he ran a three fifty-eight mile um, in a three thirty-eight fifteen hundred meters. So, um, very, very talented young man um, with a huge future, um, and he's just started at the University of Washington. He raced his first. Uh, track race over there in the week weekend and he broke a New Zealand record for the 1000 meters so ran a 221 um he was running in the B race as coach there was being a bit conservative put him in the B race and he actually had the fastest time um uh, from the A and B um and yeah took down a few of the pro athletes who had been to the Olympics previously so he was pretty stoked with that and it's such a good signs for this year for him yeah for sure mm. and uh in terms of triathlon you also have uh, triathletes that you coach uh, and uh, the most famous name would be hayden wild uh, who most listeners will be familiar with from east wts and uh, and super league triathlon yeah. racing what's uh what sort of what's the rest of your coaching looking like what sort of breakdown of elites uh, and the amateurs and <clears throat> runners versus triathletes are you looking at in your uh, athletes table so to say yeah, so I have a really massive range. So I have um, quite a few um, kind of recreational runners, you know, people who want to just break two hours for the half marathon or they want to do 100K ultra or they want to do an Ironman. So I have quite a few of those kind of athletes. Uh, and then they range right through to guys like Hayden and Sam who, uh, you know, at the pinnacle of their sport and, um, you know, are true international um, athletes. So it can be a bit tricky at times trying to judge, trying to balance um the workouts and especially when they're local trying to you know you don't want to put a two-hour half marathon in a, in a workout with Hayden because it's never going to work um, 
So you have to be you have to be a bit mindful about that kind of stuff and just making sure I have the right people there on the right day so um, everyone can get the, the best out of their training sessions. So, no, so it's probably 50-50 between triathletes and runners. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. At what point did you end up getting into coaching and, and how did that transition happen from being an athlete to being a coach? Yeah. So probably, um, I don't know, it, I kind of almost look back at it now and think when I was at school, like when I was 14, 15 years old, I was self-coaching and just learning from that point on. Um, and, you know, you, you learn your whole life. And I think it really started back then, probably formally, um, I set up a full-time coaching business um, in 2013, and that was probably the formality of something I'd already been doing for a long time prior. I, I worked um, in London, uh, 99 and 2000, probably 2001, arguably, um, for Kim McDonald, who represented a lot of the Kenyan athletes um, who were you know, Olympians and world record holders at the time. And so my role with him was as an assistant coach, um, kind of looking back at it now, I don't think that was my title, but looking back now that was kind of part of my role was to be assistant coach Kim was constantly on the road um and when the athletes were in London um my job was to take them to the track and you know take them through the workout and then feedback to Kim on what I observed and he would do a lot of the diamond league entries based on what I'd kind of information I'd given him so um excuse me so from that sense you know I think that was a huge grounding in high performance as a grounding in what athletes can handle um, and putting athletes together who are going to benefit greatly, um, you know, as well. That's it's played a massive part in what I've done since then. Uh, those runners that you worked with under Kim McDonald, those were uh, mostly or exclusively African top runners. Is that correct? Or was it a mix of Africans, Europeans? Yeah, mostly African. So um, probably the most famous is um, the real Daniel Komen, the 3000 meter world record holder. Um, he's he still is, um, and Noah Ying, who won the 2000 Olympic 1500. So they were probably two of the most high profile. Moses Kiptanui, for those who um, are true aficionados, um, will remember that name. Um, and there were probably, I mean, I think in 2000, we had 10 guys under 13 minutes for 5,000 metres. So it was, a, it was a massive stable of athletes who were all extremely talented. Um, yeah, so it was, it was mostly track runners. But we did have a few um, Americans. So um, Bob Kennedy was there. Um, John Brown, the marathoner, the English marathoner. Um, yeah, there were a few other guys as well who, who went on the scene. So can you point to something specific that you learned from working in that environment, <clears throat> whether it's uh, an anecdote or, or just a general thought process or framework for coaching that you take with you to, to this day? Yeah, that's an interesting question because there's probably a whole raft of things that I could I could nitpick out of it. But one of the kind of one of the overarching things that Kim and I remember him saying it to me. I don't know, not maybe not quite for quote, but he kind of said to me, you know, these guys are thoroughbreds. It doesn't really matter the work that you give them as long as they're doing big chunks of work and doing it well, then um, they will run well. And that was kind of one of the one of the things that I've picked up on and I, I use even now with guys like Hayden. Is it? Is it the nitty gritty of stuff doesn't really matter. It's, he was very much an artist and I kind of look at myself that way as well in terms of, you know, it doesn't matter what zone you're in. If you're, as, long, as long as you're doing big chunks of work at the right periods and, you know, they, you're doing them well and you're recovering from them, then um, you'll benefit in the long run. So um, that was kind of one of the things that I really took away from um, my time working for Kim and also Alan Story, who was my coach when I was in London. Um, he was the British high performance coach I think at the time um, and he was my personal coach and he was he was really good um, he had that same philosophy yeah that's really cool and uh, yeah. going back to Lydiard uh, that you use in your own self-coaching how how big a role that, that, does that still play in your coaching today how big an influence has Lydiard been on you I think it probably creates a, um, an underlying framework that I use um, I'm not I wouldn't say I'm a Lydia disciple, but there are certain elements in there that, you know, you'd never go away from. Well, I would never go away from as a coach. So, um, and, you know, that would be, you know, some of the mileage, um, making sure those long runs are, are, are present every week and um, and that, you know, it's done at a, at a reasonable intensity. It's not a long, slow distance run. It's a, it's a reasonably intense effort um, that, you know, you can chunk through and then recover from. 
So what does uh, Hayden Wilde's uh, long, weekly long run look like in terms of distance, duration, and uh, pace, if you can go into that? Uh, well, there's, it kind of ranges. Um, but probably for most of the year, he would do um, at least an hour and a half of running. Um, and in that hour and a half, he would cover 21, 22 kilometers. Um, he just, last weekend, he ran with one of our top marathoners, Malcolm Hicks, and he, I think he did 33 kilometers um and it was at kind of 345 pace or something like that so um that was that was a little bit um a little bit different for him but um it was yeah something that we thought was worthwhile doing at the time so Mm. and uh and on that same note for obviously hayden is uh, racing olympic distance and will be running a 10k in around about uh, 30 minutes or so so an hour and a half is uh, already like a massive over distance in terms of duration at least yes. but for age groupers that are a bit slower and maybe training for half distance or even full distance triathlons what's your philosophy on the on the long run in in that routine and, and the training schedule uh, for that demographic uh, yeah, so by half distance, I assume you're half Ironman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my philosophy for that would be be very similar um, in that depending on their level, um, I would maybe look for time on the feet rather than um, distance that they would run. So maybe I would get them to run as, as long as they would potentially be out there on race day, um, maybe as a, as a maximum, depending on at what level they were. Um, the faster ones, I would certainly have them going a little bit longer. Mm, okay and mm. and for the full ironman uh how how long would you have the athletes go there well probably up to up to two hours depending again depending on their, their level so i'd have them over you know up and over two hours um and that might come off the end of the bike as well so uh it might be a you know a, a three to four hour brick um on the on the bike and then you know a two hour run so a, a pretty long day yeah yeah Going back a bit to to the athletes that you coach, uh, so do you have any more like elite uh, triathletes, or for example, for example, like Hayden, does he train in a in a group with other elite level triathletes, or is it a lot of solo training for him, being in New Zealand where uh, there's not as many high performance centers and things like that that you might have in the US or Australia or the UK? How does that work? Yeah, so he does. He used to train a lot with Sam. Uh, so when Sam was based here, uh, they trained quite a bit together, and they did a few sessions while Sam was back um, over summer, uh, by the Christmas period. Sorry. Um, so that was that was good. Um, we have I coach quite a few juniors um, who are kind of eighteen, nineteen years old, and they I get them to train with Hayden occasionally, but they can only do it in small chunks. Otherwise, he'll destroy them. So. Um, I, I kind of get them to come in and train with him for a few days and then they disappear off and go and train, you know, back where they've come from or by themselves again. Um, but Hayden does do probably 80 to 90% of his training alone. So I can, I can do it. I can still run with him uh, for most of his runs, just not his workout. Yeah. yeah. And, and do you think that that puts him at a disadvantage compared to, to the athletes uh, that he's competing against a lot of whom are training in that sort of daily training environment where they are training with other top wts athletes or do you think that it's not so much of a of a detriment because the training can be really individualized and that might be a, a potential benefit of not having to stick with a group yeah no i don't think it um I don't think it affects him at all. I, I, you know, this year he had a he had a standout year or a breakout year, maybe. Um, and you know, at this point of the season already, he's he's well ahead of where he was last year. So, um, you know, he's only improving. Um, he's only been in the sport. It was his first WTS season this year, so he's only been in the sport really one year, um, and he's already better than he was this time last year. So, um, you know, I think what we're what we've done and what we've what we've created with him is working really well. Um, I have no no desire to change um, that philosophy or the the model that we've got here at all. I think we just need to um, keep keep building on it. Um, maybe when when and if he plateaus, um, we will look to change things. You know, in that respect. But I think at the moment we'll just leave it as it is. Yeah. And I yeah, yeah I I think the being able to get out there and do big chunks of hard work alone um, is hugely valuable mentally as well as physically and that you're not sitting on the wheel drafting or you're not sitting in a group of runners. Um, you actually, you know, got the wind on your nose and um, you're grinding hard. Um, and 
you know making you want it yeah yeah and and obviously in uh, in long distance triathlon that's uh, more definitely much more the norm than uh, than yeah. the exception but it seems that in the on the WTS circuits that a lot of the athletes are really uh, training in various training groups but uh, yes i've seen that as well uh, not at the WTS uh, level necessarily but in training groups that uh, a long ride might not be anything more than just sitting on your bike because you're already, always sitting on somebody's wheel and then what's the point you might just as well stay in bed so do you think that in some ways maybe groups uh, can be a bit of a detriment for certain athletes at least or what's what's your take on that just generally speaking of how training groups and daily training environments are used at uh, the elite triathlon level and the draft legal level specifically yeah well i think it's probably a case of um people feel like they're missing out by not being part of a group like that so they kind of seek it out um and in reality, you know, maybe they're better to be by themselves. Someone like Hayden probably is better to be by himself because he's he knows how to work hard. Um, he's not afraid to, um, you know, ride for five hours into a headwind. He's, you know, he'll, he'll put his he'll put his nose in the wind and, and go for it. Um, so, yeah. So, and I don't think sitting in a group for five hours would would benefit him on the bike, you know, so much. Uh, as much as the company is nice, it's not um, it's not the training effect that I think he he requires. So yeah yeah uh it goes back back a little bit to that linear philosophy of uh the the long run isn't uh, you know just uh, going out and taking a walk in the in the forest you are, you're actually doing some work even though it's not you know okay. an all-out intensity but it's but it's steady and the same per- perhaps should go for those bike rides and they end up being more like coffee rides when when you are yeah. in a group rather than <laughs> steady riding exactly and i don't know that benefits anyone when those kind of things happen so they're nice and yeah. social they, you know they're a good feel good factor but when you're trying to be one of the best in the world i don't know that it's that beneficial yeah so uh, if you can you uh, describe your coaching philosophy in in a bit more detail we've already touched upon a, a couple of things but uh, but if you describe it give you give an overview of how you think about coaching uh, what what would that look like uh yeah, that's a that's a really complicated question because I've probably touched on a lot of stuff and um, yeah, I, I really don't know how to expand on that too much more um, than what you've probably already heard. I, I'm i I'm very much a, a coach who kind of demands hard work from the athletes and uh, the athletes who I take on know that I'm going to work them pretty, pretty hard um, most of the time, um, you know, balance in between, you know, rest weeks or rest days. Um, I'll require them to, to work, you know, pretty solid. Um, I, I don't have a, I don't have a softly, softly approach, um, to, to coaching. Yeah. I, yeah, not sure kind of how else to expand on it. If you've got any questions, they might lead me down the path. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll, I have, I have a few follow up questions then that, uh, they will, uh, that, that, that we will dig into. So the first one is, uh, well, you said that you worked in pretty hard. Uh, what mm-hmm. does that look like? Is it uh, more on the volume side or on the intensity side you refer to, or a mix of both? Where do you stand on that balance between volume and intensity? I'm probably an 80-20 person when it comes to volume and intensity, um, and pretty much all through the year. And as I kind of talked about earlier with Tim McDonald's philosophy is, you know, just big chunks of work at the right time, um, get results. Um, and there's no, you know, there's no magic sessions there's no you know magic tricks you can do on the bike or you know when you're running it's just it's just all about that work that you that you put in you know at this time of year for the guys who are racing um on the itu circuit so um big volumes at the moment so training uh for training for hayden's probably at its at its biggest at, at this point of, of the year so i think last year last week he had 150 kilometer run week um i don't know probably spent eight hours in the pool and, you know, maybe 12 hours on the bike. So it was a, it was a massive week for him. Um, not a heck of a lot of intensity in there, um, but it was just a lot of volume for him. So, um, so yes, so probably, probably an 80, 20 balance pretty much year round. Um, yep. Yeah. And, and that's the nature of the training um, look pretty similar even though volume will taper off a bit and uh, maybe you'll do some more intense how how much periodization do you work with or is it fairly similar through the year what what what's your take on that sort of periodization and uh, cycling through different uh, different phases yeah so this year i guess 
like if we're talking about Aiden, each year is going to be a little bit different than what is the pinnacle event for that year. So obviously Tokyo is our is our fake focus for this year. So we've got our racing block that we're going to do through March. So um, he got home from Super League in November. Um, he had a couple of weeks, um, and I won't say off because he doesn't do very well with off. He has a couple of weeks of exercise <laughs> where he, he just basically goes and rides his mountain bike and goes to some trail runs and swims in the surf. Um, and so a couple of weeks of that and then we jump back into training and it's pretty much big volume base work um, until uh, probably February and then we'll start looking at some speed work. Um, we've done we've done a little bit already in terms of around some things around the sprint mechanics. Um, the focus of the last two years has been getting him towards the front of the race so he can you know, be there and contend. Um, now he's at the front and we want him to win these things. So we've changed things a little bit in that respect that we um, want to work on his closing speed. Um, and some of the speed work we do will be kind of pure speed work on the running front. And so that we can, you know, you can get to the last 500 meters and have a sprint with Vincent Louis and, and hopefully not lose. Um, so that intensity will change a little bit in that respect. Um, and after that, after that block in March, he'll go back into I think he's got an eight-week window to his next race, or maybe seven weeks. So he'll go back into a little bit of a base block there, so that we can get him ready to survive through to Tokyo. So, yeah. mm. and 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 what does uh, how does recovery factor in? Uh, like, do you regularly schedule in a few days of uh, of really easy training, or do you more focus on making sure that the weeks are like? challenging but still sustainable so a sort of workload that can be sustained week in week out and and then only if uh, recovery is needed do you work that in yeah so we have yeah so basically the second one so um the volume and intensity is kind of balanced through the week i generally give him at least one day where it's it's pretty light um he might still do three to four hours of training but it it, it will be light um and you know the intensity is right out of it and he can basically recover from that um in that, in that day if if for example you know last week i mentioned he did a long run with or one of the marathoners malcolm hicks from new zealand um and he had a complete rest day the next day uh from that so it just depends on what they've done in the in the lead up to, to that point in time is um what's required to you know have him survive and not break down um that'd be the last thing yeah. Want, so, yeah 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 uh and and the the hard workouts that you do in so you mentioned the sprint work uh, what about uh, other hard work do you focus more on uh on paces that are like race pace and above so sort of like the classic polarized model or do you also work in a lot of uh, traditional tempo or threshold kind of work what, what's your thought on that or is it just a mix of of all of those different ranges on the spectrum yeah just a just a bit of a mix so um so for hayden maybe a traditional set, set of 1k so you might do uh, you know this time of year you might do eight 1ks and you'd be running those at somewhere between three minutes and 305 so um just to maybe if just to ride around his off the bike pace um and he would have 90 seconds recovery and he'd got to bang that out and then you know be be fine afterwards have a you know, have a really good chunk of work done get on be able to get on the bike in the afternoon and have a ride and and you know, still be and still be okay the next day um some some sessions maybe if uh sam was here they might do four or five one k's and they might rip those out in you know closer to 240 um with a few minutes recovery and that that's a very different session and has very different demands on the body and certainly requires a bit more recovery so um that save those ones for um very close to race day yeah hmm. do you, so would those sessions be something that uh, by the time you get to the last repetition you really need to to go almost with with all the energy that you have left in the tank or or do you want your athletes uh, to to always leave have the traditional like one rep left in the tank sort of approach to their workouts what's your thoughts on that no i think if you've got one rep left you can do one more um and you, you know you should go you should go out there and empty the tank not to the point of um, spewing all over the place, but um, just you know, making sure that you you have actually um, emptied the tank and and had a really good training session. Um, obviously, you don't want to be beaten up to the point where you can't you do anything for the for three days. That you know you've definitely gone too far if you're at that point. But um, yeah, if you can still get up and you know do your 
do the training the next day, then you've got it right. Okay, yeah. Mm. And uh, when when you are in a period of a lot of racing that uh, happens in triathlon and at the Olympic and sprint distance level, how do you maintain a peak when you might not be able to train as much if you're racing quite a lot, like sometimes back to back weekends or racing two or three times in a month? Uh, generally speaking, what what does that race period training look like? Yeah, well, I think the ability to be able to do that really. Um, is built at this time of year. So um, if you have developed a, a strong enough athlete and a robust enough athlete at this time of year, um, you can race back to back for three or maybe even four weekends in a row and not be too beaten up. Those weeks in between, uh, you know, there's really no training as such that goes on. Um, it's just, you know, a couple of days of recovery, maybe one one ride and run with a little bit of effort in there just to freshen the body up and then, you know, get ready for the next race and that's all you've got time for. So, um, but the ability to do that um, is built right now. So, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and how long do you think that you can maintain that ability before you might need to put in another serious block of bigger training again? Uh, I think if you can, I think if you can get through, you know, three weeks in a row of racing and then have another three weeks of training, um, you, you, you'll probably be all right. Um, too much, you know, anything less than that starts to impact. Um, and But it also also depends on the athlete. Some athletes are very good at racing back-to-back, and Hayden is one of those. You know, he, he recovers really well. Um, he's strong and robust, um, doesn't really break down. Um, and, you know, he can he can handle that. Um, there are, I know there are other athletes out there who, you know, can only race once a month because they're a little bit more fragile and don't quite have um, that ability to, bounce back and recover well mm-hmm. might be a little bit more injury and, and how do you think that the the mental uh, recovery has uh, ha, has a part to play there as well like there's some athletes have the ability to week in week on week out go out and and uh, really bury themselves and uh, and do that kind of effort that racing really requires but for some athletes that just mentally takes such a big toll on them that uh, that for that reason it, they might also not be able to race successfully at least as often as others. Yeah, potentially. Um, so also they may be not enjoying it. <laughs> that could be it. I, I know Hayden just loves it. He, he frosts on um, getting out there and racing and um, you know trying to put the other guys to the sword. So um, that's something he really enjoys. Um, maybe other people don't enjoy it as much and they really have to work hard to get themselves in a, in a mental space to do that. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess again, so everyone... one, one one interesting trend that we've observed in uh, recent years in triathlon is uh, the jumping back and forth between different distances. So we have Super mm. League triathlon, which is extremely exciting and but very short and sharp. And athletes like Hayden and others are jumping from that to the Olympic distance, which of course requires. Uh, has quite different demands but maybe not so much as it's the same athletes that are successful or both those and the same happens when athletes are going from the sprint and olympic distance to the 7.3 distance with uh, gustav eden for example winning the 7.3 worlds uh, this year or this uh, last year in uh, in nice so how similar or different do you think that these various distances really are when it comes to the demands on the athlete and the training? Uh, are they very similar or are there some differences? What are your thoughts on that? I think you'll probably find that the guys who have the ability to transition between those events are the guys who are really strong riders in the ITU. Um, and because Hayden isn't the best swimmer in the ITU circuit, he you know, we quite often look at a field and go, okay, who are you likely to come out of the water with? Who who do we need to help, you know, to work you back to the front if, that, if there's a, you know, 30-second gap? Who, you know, who do we need there? And you, you look at the um, Norwegians and you, you look at um, Richard uh, Murray and a couple of other guys and you go, okay, well, these are the guys who are going to help that train and bring it all together. Um, and those are the guys who uh, have the ability to transition across into 70.3 racing. Um, but are also dynamic and fast enough to race Super League. So I think that's uh, that's the type of athlete who has that ability to transition across. In, in Super League, though, the the swim seems to also be of like maybe even even more important sometimes than than in the standard WTS uh, format. Uh, 
what if but that i don't know maybe, maybe i'm wrong about that because um, hayden has obviously been very successful at super league yeah and some others but still you see vincent louis really dominating the field there and uh, quite often on a second swim or a third swim of an enduro he just takes off and nobody can can hang with him anymore what what's what do you think about that yeah so that you're probably 100 percent right in that fact um and that if it's a swim time trial or if it's a second and third swim, that's where the cracks come um, in the field. Uh, I think the swim is short enough um, on the first swim if they're all together that there's really no separation. Um, there might be 10 second separation from first to first to last, but uh, basically all together getting onto the bike. So um, the, the distance is not long enough to create big spaces, but on that second and third swim, you know, they did definitely some gaps appear. So, you know, we've we've talked about that um, after the last round of Super League and how we can, you know, nullify that or do something about it. So hopefully um, the ideas that we've got have, uh, are going to, you, know, um, you know, come to fruition come Super League time again. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the run? Uh, the difference between running something like a mile in a Super League race, one to two kilometers, and uh, uh, potentially a few times, depending on the format again, and uh, then going to a 10 kilometer for an Olympic and and then all the way up to a 21 kilometer in a half distance. How how big a difference and, and <clears throat> how, what kind of uh, uh, attributes does an athlete need to have to be able to be successful at those various distances? And is it the case that some athletes just are not able to be very good at either the short end or the long end of, of that stuff if they are more skewed towards one side of the aerobic and aerobic spectrum. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. If you've got a, an athlete who can can redline it, so to speak, and hold it in the red um, and, you know, and not falter, then they will they will do well. And you watch the guys like Vincent Louis, you know, he's got that ability to, to rev that engine really high um, and and be absolutely fine and, and not falter. Um, you know, there are there are others who you would suspect or would have thought would do really well at that uh, Super League distances and they, they don't quite have it. So um, I think, you know, some athletes, when they when they get to that point where the, the engine's revved up and, you know, they can't hold it there and they just they aren't, haven't got the ability to recover or buffer the lactate, then um, they, you know, they start slowing. So, um but, you know, it's very similar to uh, mixed team relay. Um, and you'll see the guys who are good at mixed team relay are also very good at Super League. So it's the same It's the same athletes coming across. And I, I think it, it won't be very long until we see a clear demarcation between, you know, the Super League type athletes, mixed team relay uh, exponents, should we call them, because they'll be specialists in my opinion. Um, and then... You know, to sprint an Olympic distance if the Olympic distance stays at that standard um, distance as it, as it is at the moment. Uh, I think there'll be some specialist athletes coming in um, into those spots. And and that uh, brings some interesting challenges in for the athletes and the coaches because there's a certain number of spots on the Olympic team. So at least as it is right now, uh, the federation can only or the country can only bring so many athletes. They need to choose for the mixed team relay. Uh, slots among the athletes that are also competing in the individual event so uh, so athletes essentially need to be good at both and uh, and the federation might uh, uh, choose to have se- selection criteria that that give them the best chance in in as many <laughs> many of the, those events as possible so so it puts the onus on athletes and coaches perhaps to if you're not really good at that really short and, and fast stuff to to train that and do you think that that's something that is very trainable or do you think that there is a very strong genetic component as well and uh, and for a lot of athletes it's just not really uh, easy or possible to uh, to improve that uh, that sort of end of the range very much at all i don't know i think if you like it to track and field you're asking a 1500 meter runner to do the same job as the 10,000 meter runner and i think um that's you know everyone can understand that there's a clear difference between those two athletes and, and their abilities and the engine that's inside them. Um, I also think that the Olympic selection and it's going to be some really interesting selections. I think from some countries um, and and the the pressure they put on them in the individual races to maybe not um, not bury themselves and save it for the relay. I think there might be some gamesmanship there to make sure that their relays perform really well if that's what how they've selected. 
um, your teams um, or vice versa. So there's going to be some interesting outcomes, I think, um, as a result of the way that the policies and the, the format has been um, set up at the moment. So. Mm, yeah, for sure. Uh, with, with Hayden, does the training look... Uh, do, do you have, have you changed the training at, at all uh, just uh, when you're working towards a Super League event, for example, uh, versus if you were just to have the WTS season of sprint and Olympic distance uh, races or like are you working more on on that top end speed in in that phase of the season uh, or or is it you're building the engine generally speaking and and you're hoping that it will carry through in all the events what does that look like yeah just building the engine generally and then hoping it'll carry through with a few specific sessions and the lead up um a lot of times there's, there's not much time in, in between events at that time of the season so you might only have maybe three weeks if you're lucky, probably two, um, between an ITU and then the Super League starting up. So, um, yeah, we, we managed to get a few sessions in that are a bit more specific. Um, a lot of those are skill-based, um, particularly um, running and then diving into the water and, and swimming swimming hard. Um, it's a skill that most of the athletes don't, uh, don't train. Um, so that's something that we focus on at that time of year to make sure that he's, you know, well prepared for that. Um, and he can, he can dive in and swim hard, um, you know, after running very, very fast. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, next question that I wanted to get into a little bit is, uh, outside of swimming, biking and running, uh, things like strength training, nutrition, sleep, uh, what are your opinions on uh, the importance of these outside aspects how much do you help your coached athletes with them or give advice recommendations guidelines for those and which ones do you think are really the most important the most important is sleep uh, and probably second and third and fourth and fifth most important as well um and then probably nutrition after that i think i, I think if you're taking care of those two aspects um then you'll go a long way to creating a very good athlete um Sleep is probably the the most underrated um, thing that an athlete you know can do, um, and the, the ability to you know turn the phone off at nine thirty at night and and go to sleep um, you know is pretty rare on young athletes. They like to you know Instagram and Snapchat and um, chat to each other till all hours of the night. So I think if you can get them to turn that off um, and actually have some good quality sleep, um, then you know. You, you, you're a long way ahead. Um, nutrition, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a dietitian. So my advice is always just good, clean eating, um, and you know, the less processed food, the better. Um, and making sure that the, the the protein to carb ratios after training, are, are, you know, are good, and um, the athletes are, are getting the food that they need to fuel the next training session. Yeah. 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 Do, do you think it's common? Do you think it's common for for athletes uh, at different levels? This might be looked very different in at the elite level compared to the amateur level. Is it uh, common to not get enough uh, calories in, or are a lot of athletes at the risk of getting too much? Uh, do Do you have an idea about that? I think probably a lot of athletes under eat, to be honest. Um, and I think you see it in, in the frames of some of the athletes, uh, male and female. I think you know some of them look very thin um, and look a bit malnourished um, and they would probably actually perform way better if they were um, you know had a, had a bit more meat on the bone so to speak um, a, a lot of it is social media driven and you know they, they see their competitors and they you know see people online and they want to mimic that and think that's how they should look and um, you know it's not a great it's not great modeling for young athletes so it's, it, it's a very very tough one bit of a minefield mm. yeah for sure uh, what do you think in general are the most common mistakes that athletes and this might be amateur or professional or you might uh, speak uh, to some different different mistakes in those two demographics but what, what do you think are the most common mistakes that uh, that athletes do in their triathlon in general whether it's in training or outside of training uh, i think i think if you're talking amateur kind of age group level uh, athletes i think they spend too much time worrying about the small things that make you know one percent of difference um and they should just get out and swim or ride or run um and spend time you know building their aerobic engine um and you know not such too much time on 
you know the latest fad um, with Pilates or, or you know Pilates is great, but it's it, it's it's not going to help you that much in in a, in respect to you know being out on the run for three hours. Um, so I think you're better off going out and running um, and spending your time doing that and your money. Um, professionally, uh, I, I wouldn't like to. I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> um, probably, probably a lot of athletes train too fast, um, day in and day out. Um, they don't have, they don't have enough easier days where they're where they're actually trying to recover and let the body repair. Um, and I think it's probably a, a common fault for both amateur and professional. So when you uh, so this brings me to another question, bringing us back a little bit to the training and coaching prescription. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when you tr- uh, coach somebody like Hayden, do, what, how do you prescribe the workouts? And specifically on on easier days, do you have heart rate ceilings, or is it based on pace ceilings, or or just general zones, whether whether you're using pace or heart rate that uh, that uh, you that you hold them accountable to do not go faster or harder than this what, what does that look like in the prescription no so i would with so for hayden i would you know go and get him to do a, a 30 minute run for example and i quite often call it just an easy jog and just a really slow jog and just go out and just just really jog for 30 minutes and you might only do 6k or six and a half k doesn't really matter um but he knows that it's that's all it is um so a lot of it's terminology and understanding the athlete and what, what drives them. Some athletes I have to put in a pace for them. Um, otherwise they can't cope with, with that. They, they wouldn't know exactly what kind of pace they need to go. Um, or power on the bike, for example. So, um, yeah, so just, it really depends on the athlete, but I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a great user of heart rate. Um, I find that most of the heart rate watches, um, are pretty unreliable, especially the ones with the, um, the thing in the back of them. So unless they're using a strap, um, I almost disregard it for the most part. Um, I find power and pace for running um, you know, way better. Mm. And and on the elite level, when you say that you think a lot of athletes are going too fast, do you think that's an athlete mistake that they get the prescription to go for an easy jog, but they don't adhere to that? Or is it a coaching mistake that the coaches do not understand the importance of going easy enough often enough or where do you think that the, the mistake originates from i think it's probably athlete um driven um you know i like to think that athlete, uh, coaches understand um that recovery is you know is as important as training and um you know and i'd say it's probably athlete driven and you know these groups of athletes training together and we go back to our training groups again um you know if they go out for a, an hour run and it's supposed to be an hour easy um and they end up you know, banging it out at sub four minute Ks, then they may think, oh, we weren't going that hard. But in reality, that's a pretty solid, you know, load of um, stress on the body. Um, and if it was supposed to be an easy run, they're probably not setting themselves up very well for the next day, um, which is, you know, the most important thing. So, Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So, uh, uh, by the way, I really uh, completely agree with your uh, mistake for the amateur triathletes as well, putting too much uh, focus on on the one percenters when there's uh, so many more yeah. uh, big rock that uh, that can yeah. uh, can have a much bigger impact. Uh, yeah. On that same note, what would be your uh, one or two or even three final pieces of advice for for amateur age group uh, triathletes for uh, improving uh, triathlon at uh, at the level that they're at with with families and and jobs and stuff and not an almost unlimited amount of time to to train and recover like the pros have yeah i think some i don't know it's, it's really hard to give advice <laughs> um I think probably just enjoy what you're doing and, and um, don't worry so much about the small things that are available um, and like just turn over those big rocks as you, as, as you get to them and, and, you know, get out there and, and ride your bike and then go for a run and maybe, you know, even leave the watch at home sometimes because it, if it's stressing you out, some people get a bit anxious about the time and what have you and the distance at the run and just go out and enjoy what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and I think that, well, longevity in sport, I think that's one of the most important things is that you, you know, you really, you really do love what you're doing and that's why you're doing it. Um, and there's, you know, there may be other drivers, but, um, that is the most important. Um, and I think that's one of the things that probably a lot of people lose sight of, especially those who are trying to qualify for, you know, age group worlds and those kind of things. So they get a bit carried away. Yeah. 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 
So let's uh, start to wrap up with the rapid fire questions. So just uh, short one sentence answers to these questions, uh, starting with what's your favorite book, blog or resource related to triathlon or running endurance sports in general? Uh, well, probably my, my favorite running book is Advanced Marathoning by Peter Fitzinger. Um, he was a coach of mine for a couple of years and he's now the CEO of Athletics New Zealand, but it's probably one of the best books I've read around um, running, training and marathoning. So it's probably my favorite book. I quite often pick that up and have a read. Yeah. yeah and there's a new third edition, I believe, that uh, was published a few months ago. So highly recommended. I totally agree. Great book. Yeah, it is. Uh, what's uh, your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Uh Probably just my running shoes, actually. I come from that background, so I just love to put my shoes on and go out for a run. Um, you know, I, I, wear, I love my watch as well because I love to put stuff on Strava and, um, and annoy people on there, so it's, it's good. Yeah. But just my running shoes, yeah. Just love to get out and run. And finally, what do you wish you had known or done differently at some point in your uh, athletic or coaching career? Uh, I think going back, probably choosing a better university to go to <laughs> when I was 18 years old. Um, I think that probably would have been probably the, the biggest difference I could have made to my career. Yep. Right. Where can listeners uh, find out more about you and uh, your coaching and, and everything you've got going on? Um, I, I'm a Facebook user, so Craig Kirkwood Coaching or just Craig Kirkwood on Instagram. Um, I try and do as much as I can on there and um, keep, the, keep the fans entertained. Uh, I, I quite often I'm not a very serious person I, I do like to joke around so um, I yeah a lot of stuff on there is maybe an inside joke and you may not get it but um, yeah I try I try and keep it entertaining and keep it lighthearted. <laughs> yeah sounds good <laughs> we'll we'll have uh, we'll have those linked in the in the show notes so people can yeah. find it cool and going, just going back to the um, mistakes that people made I didn't mean to pick on Pilates that was just the example that popped in my head but um, yeah the one percenters uh, I think uh sidetrack people a lot yeah mm. perfect thank you so much craig it's been uh, really great talking to you and um, i hope that uh, you have a nice rest of your evening thank you very much i hope that you enjoyed that interview as usual you can find the show notes on that triathlon show.com and as i talked about last week i also have created a tag for these episodes where i interview coaches of elite athletes and uh, they can be found through the, the show notes or through the episode description in your podcast player app. So that's if you want to to just revisit some of these other coaches that have been talking about how they uh, coach their elite athletes. In the next episode, we have another one of these coming up, actually. So I did quite a few of these interviews, and they are all coming stacked together now. Please remember that uh, there are much more similarities than there are differences between age group and elite training. But of course, the scaling down of training is something that uh, should be uh, should be kept in mind at all times. Uh, anyway, the next episode will be with uh, Olympian Ryan Bolton, who uh, he was a US Olympian in the 2000 Sydney Olympics, and he's now coaching elite triathletes and also runners so his most famous some of his most famous athletes would be ben hoffman fourth in kona 2019 and uh, caroline rotish who is half and full marathon runner uh, famous for winning the boston marathon among others uh, that was a great interview it went long because we had a lot of stuff to talk about so uh, definitely look forward to that stay subscribed to the podcast so that you don't miss anything a Q&A is coming out on Thursday, as usual, as well. If you need any help with the training, do check out scientifictriathlon.com and consider the different training plans or coaching options that we offer. Uh, as a bit of a teaser, I am currently working on a beginner Ironman training plan. So that will definitely be the next training plan released. And it may actually be close to finished by the time you hear this, because I'm recording quite some time in advance. So you can email me to michael at scientific triathlon.com and it's michael with a k if you're interested and want to hear the latest status of it big thanks to our sponsors precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com if you haven't taken their free online sweat test definitely do that that will help you get an idea of how you should think about electrolytes and hydration and use the discount code that triathlon show 15 to get 15 percent off your order and a big thanks to roca the world-leading manufacturers of wetsuits, dry suits, swimskins, goggles, and high-performance eyewear. 
Visit roka.com forward slash TTS to get 20% off your order. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.